Welcome to Untold Physio Stories Podcast, your perfect commute resource with physio failures, successes, interesting cases, and more from the physio and rehab world with your host, Drs. Andrew Rothschild and Urson Religioso. Topical analgesics help patients alleviate pain and reduce discomfort. I recommend and use Helix Professional Pain Relief Creams with my patients. Helix has three new creams they've added to their line of topical analgesics. Joining their pain relieving cream is Triactive Therapy Cream, CBD Therapy, and CBD Clinical Creams. My patients have been raving about these creams, and that's why I'm offering you an opportunity to try these in your practice. Email my exclusive promo code MMT2 to helix at helix4, the number four, pain.com to receive samples of these new professional pain relief creams and find a medical to supply distributor near you. You'll get a starter kit with several samples, patient information brochures, and it's a great way to help patients and grow your practice. Welcome back to Untold Physio Stories podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. E, with Modern Manual Therapy, Edge Mobility System, and my new eclectic approach network. It's a private network like social media, think Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Without all the ads and tracking, you can join that for free at modmt.com slash members. And I have a very special guest today, my co-host, Dr. Andrew Rothschild. How's it going today, Andrew? <laughs> good, Erson. How you doing? Good, good. So you got a story for me. And, and this also has not been why Andrew hasn't been on. We just haven't connected. It's not like he hasn't had a case. Although this I think you really haven't had a case in a while. <laughs> I probably haven't really had a good case in a while, just until only until the last few weeks when I thought it was uh, worthy of the podcast. All right. Yeah, let's hear it. What's going on? So I had a patient. So I had a, I'd seen a, a guy um, last year for a similar thing, and he just came back in uh, just a couple weeks ago on the opposite side. Um, and so for context, on the on the original uh, issue that I saw him for the previous year was a right-sided sort of superior scapular pain, you know, upper trap, levator, rhomboid kind of area. No specific incident. He does CrossFit, um, but there wasn't anything like you know, any specific incident that happened during any particular training session. He also travels a lot um, by plane. He goes back and forth to Canada a lot for work, so in a lot of sitting, a lot of airplanes. Uh, those kinds of things, hotel rooms. Um, and so it was this sort of this dis diffuse ache, tightness kind of thing, but it was really no specific. It wasn't rotator cuff. It wasn't a little bit of muscle tension in the cervical spine, but it wasn't any kind of cervical radiculopathy or referral kind of pattern. Um, responded really well to dry needling, as well as just your general sort of scapular thoracic exercises, some self mobilization, a lot of some repeated retractions, upper thoracic extension, these kinds of things as resets for especially with his traveling. Uh, and that was last year, you know, during during COVID. And then he comes back, just like I said, a couple of weeks ago. Now it's on his left side. It's more intense. It's a very similar kind of distribution, upper trap, levator, rhomboid. It, it's just a little bit more. He's got significantly limited um, overhead. Uh, overhead motion on the left side, can't really reach overhead, uh, abduction, very limited, mostly just due to pain and tightness. Again, cervical, nothing remarkable, just a little bit of discomfort with rotation um, and flexion, but more just muscle tension, diffuse, very, very sensitive, like hyperalgesia to palpation along the medial scapula, scapula border. Um, even like, reaching behind his back also is also um, uh, limited and painful. And then, you know, he, he again, there's no specific incident that he can report right before symptoms began. The only thing he could think of was that, like, about two weeks prior, he had been surfing uh, in Virginia Beach. Uh, and he had been, like, holding his board with his left hand in front and his right hand kind of behind him. And, again, I guess he was kind of – some waves were coming in or something. So he was kind of, like, sideways resisting the waves that coming in kind of with a lot of, you know, force and tension through his left arm and left upper back. But he said, like, you know, you know, surf, finished surfing that day, the next day, no problem. And, you know, days after that, no problem. So that was the only thing he could think of that may have been some potential thing. But again, he's like, things didn't begin until like at least a couple of weeks after that thing. But other than that, nothing else he can think of. He hadn't been doing any regular CrossFit, you know, so thinking just a lot of repetitive overhead work or something really had not been doing that. So he's kind of puzzled as to why this happened. Coincidentally, like after the first visit or two that I saw him, 
uh, an orthopedic surgeon that I follow on Twitter, uh, Dr. Howard Lux, posted a case that he saw of uh, a young man that had come in with this, sort of this intense scapula pain, but in this case, it had been going on for like over a year. It was like super painful. Uh, he was an overhead athlete, I think, in his case, and just was like putting it out there for people to comment on. And then a, a, another PT that I follow had posted on, you know, what he thought might have been and then posted an article on dors dorsal scapular nerve entrapment. And so I, you know, this is just all very, you know, uh, coincidental, got the article, looked at the article, and it really kind of matched um, what my patient was having in terms of symptom distribution, you know, sort of general mechanism, you know, sort of diffuse sort of presentation, sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. There's a lot of overlap with sort of that main syndrome of that, you know, cervical referral that refers to that up, you know, upper and mid thoracic region, or just sort of a general sort of upper thoracic myofascial type thing, trigger point referral. Um, there's a lot of overlap in some of the, in that symptom etiology, um, but the main etiology for dorsal scapular nerve entrapment is sort of repeated, a lot of times repeated overhead work, overhead activities. So in uh, certain laborers, certain uh, overhead sports, uh, volleyball, swimming, uh, those kinds of things, tennis, uh, and also some sort of postural can think and some component is often common, you know, with that rounded shoulders, sort of, you know, forward head posture, just because it can put a lot of sort of prolonged tension on the dorsal scapular nerve based on its attachments and sort of uh, force that it goes through the body as well as the dorsal primary rami. Um, and maybe they, they speculated in the article, it was sort of a meta-analysis of um, reviews that have been done and, and uh, cadaveric studies. Um, number one, there's also a lot of um, different distributions of the nerve. I think we learn a lot of times it's like a C4-5 distribution, but it may turn out that it's actually predominantly C5-6, actually. Um, and oftentimes it can only innervate um, levator scapula and not innervate rhomboids, and rhomboids can be innervated just by dorsal rami, and sometimes it's the other way around where it's just innervating rhomboids and levator scap is innervated by something different, and in a lot of cases it's innervating both, as we kind of learn it in PT school. So there's a lot of difference between between individuals in a lot of these studies. Um, but they also uh, theorize in, in the research that, you know, again, it's not a direct, it can be a traction injury, of course, but it also can be a gradual buildup, almost like a sort of a micro, they call it almost like a compartment syndrome within the within the nerve itself, like the nervi nervorum, uh, the nerve to the nerve, and the vascular supply to the nerve, where there gets like a, there gets a localized ischemic response, and there gets some uh, prolonged congestion. Then you got some uh, localized edema in the area, maybe areas, maybe some neural inflammation, and just causes gradual cascade that builds up into this sort of localized peripheral C five six neuropathy. Um, so this is very interesting. And it really made a lot of sense. It kind of matched um, my patient just because he was so sensitive in that area. Didn't really have any, um, you know, atrophy that can happen in some cases. No, you know, marked scapular winging or anything like that. Um, you know, lots. It, it was hard to test with strength. Sometimes is it is it more inhibition? Is it pain inhibition? You know, disuse kind of thing. Um, but it was just one of those things that doesn't necessarily. You know, what is the treatment for it? It's kind of the things that we already do manual therapy, maybe some trigger point work, joint mobilization, soft tissue work, dry needling, and of course, like exercise, maybe some postural exercise, scapothoracic strengthening, endurance, those kinds of things. But it was just kind of an interesting case. And it's, you know, one that I had not seen, or, you know, and probably maybe miss it and misdiagnose it as something else maybe um, in, in the past. But it was just an interesting case, the fact that he had a very similar presentation sort of in back-to-back -back years. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm... <laughs> You know, it's funny, if my camera was on, you could see me just like thinking and crossing my arms and being all skeptical because I'm thinking like, is this Andrew yeah. talking about this? Like, is is this the Patho Anatomy podcast? Right. <laughs> what is going on here? Because then I'm like, well, what is the treatment? Is the treatment going to be just like what we would have done anyway if we didn't have a diagnosis? Right. right. And, and, and that is sort of the take home that it seems like, yes, the treatment is, you know, regardless of the first time I didn't really have a specific diagnosis. Um, and then the fact that when it occurred again, and I happened to see this stuff on social media. It's like, wow, this is this is really what it looks like. But again, it doesn't change. Another example of the specific diagnosis doesn't always change what you do. 
but sometimes it can be helpful um, from a prognostic standpoint uh, and from a patient education standpoint, you know? Right. Well, you know, you slipped in Nervi Nervorum in there, so it made me happy. Yes. Because <laughs> I haven't actually heard that in a long time. The nerve to the nerves, as you called it. Yes. Yes. Our nerves innervated. I think David Butler wrote that a long time ago, back when he had a blog. Yeah. Nerves innervated by nerves and ner nerves have their own blood supply. But, you know, it, it also made me think that, I, you know, it seems like at least on social media, you know, we, in a good way too, sometimes, you know, the pendulum is swinging, you know, a little bit away from the patho, the emphasis on uh, pathoanatomy and biomechanics and really more towards, you know, a good biopsychosocial approach. But I think at least based on things I read, again, some, you know, it's hard to always judge context on social media, but I think sometimes people, all, you know, the bio is still there. And I think people sometimes will miss it and only focus on that, the psychosocial part, which again, it's, you know, it's been neglected for so long. So it's, it's almost like there's a little bit of an overcorrection. Um, but there is still lots of these cases that, you know, sometimes may be dismissed as just a persistent pain state when there really could be some sort of biological underpinning uh, that is sometimes, you know, ignored. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if there's one thing I think I learned in the past probably three to four years is to not dismiss the patient's story completely or like, oh, the disc doesn't matter at all, or your arthritis doesn't matter at all, or that inflammation doesn't cause pain, right? Because I think that I have upset enough people to realize that I need to just say that that is just something that fills up the cup now, as opposed to it causes the cup to completely overflow, like they think. Um, but for me, you know, seven, eight years ago, I'd be like, that doesn't matter at all. And I was like, that was my hard line, right? Right. And I've done the same thing too. And like, like de over, maybe overly de-emphasize that when in cases that it's actually, it might actually be relevant. It's just, you know, how much relevant, like you said, sometimes the patient overplays or overemphasizes how relevant they think it is, but it still may not be that relevant, but it still probably is relevant to a point. Um, and I think some of the literature, literature, even on like degenerative disc disease in the spine has shown that, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things like, not that it's, irrelevant and yes we know that that most people have these changes and don't have pain but it is probably relevant in some cases it's just hard to know what those cases are because it is so the, the the mri enough and their symptoms enough sometimes isn't always enough to know if it's that's probably there's a biological relevance in that individual case yeah i remember um gosh i always butcher his last name just like i'm sure how he would butcher mine but louis Puente de Tara? No, oh, Puente Dura. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> There's, I don't know. I feel like I add a, add a syllable or two, just like how people just randomly add like a T or a K in the middle of my name. <laughs> um, and that's my first name. Forget about my last name. But anyway, he said something about, um, actually, he was, he was referencing Louis Gifford, seminal work from like a long time ago that said that when uh, the knee has OA, that it doesn't cause pain, but what it does is cause a significant increase in uh, input, like effort input to the nervous system. So that therefore could definitely sensitize it quite a bit more than joints that didn't have significant OA. Yeah, for sure. Just right. something that fills up the cup. Yeah. And I still even think about, um, in the lumbar spine, I don't know if you ever saw that uh, back in the McKenzie days, uh, they used to always reference this one, the one surgeon. I can't remember his name now. Um, Charles he, April, maybe? No, because he was a surgeon. was a young surgeon. He had actually passed away in a car accident, but he had done some surgeries when the people, when the patients were awake. Um, and they, you know, they were locally anesthetized, but they were still awake before they did the actual surgical procedure. But he was like, uh, you know, using the surgical instruments to touch on different structures and to, you know, cause they could still feel it. And that was the whole, the whole idea was like, he could grab the healthy nerve root. He could see it was like pink and healthy and he could grab it with tweezers and shake it. And it was you know, really not at all painful. Um, but on the other side was gray and swollen and, you know, obviously, you know, been had some pathology to it. He could just brush it with a cotton swab and it would just, you know, reproduce like sharp shooting leg symptoms, you know? 
Um, and again, these are like these these were done in like a lot of like young, healthy like dancers and stuff who had sort of less acute disc herniation, sciatica, um, and just going through different you know touching on the facet joints and touching on the disc and just kind of recording what their symptoms were, um, you know, and kind of getting that different the different character of the symptoms and the different intensity of the symptoms, but you know showing sometimes like especially with the nerve, nerve can stay sensitized for a long time even when they're healing, but it's not, it's, sometimes it's more of a state of the health of the tissue, the health of the nervous system, not because un, even under normal pressure or very, you know, light, non-damaging pressure, it can cause symptoms. Yeah, that's interesting. I probably heard that along the lines with all my McKenzie training. And for those of you guys who are MDT, especially old school MDT people like me, I did not mean, mean to say uh, Charles April or Dr. April, I think his name is first name is Charles. Is it, was it orthopedist? Cause I know, I remember that he is a radiologist, <laughs> ah. but that is interesting too. I mean, yeah, that, that, and that's the whole thing with sensitization, right? I, what I think is even more interesting is, you know, you do something like that and the state of those sensitized nerves looked different than the ones that were able to handle like grabbing and wiggling with tweezers or whatever he was doing with his hands or his tweezers. Right, but then then you do something like a joint technique or mobilization or soft tissue technique or repeated in range loading, and the tissue looks exactly the same, but then its cup is empty and it's no longer sensitized, which I think is always strange, right? Because it structure can cause sensitization, but then when we desensitize it so rapidly and so significantly, the structure still looks terrible. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just all food for talking. We can go on and on and on, but I know you have another story. So we got to save that for another podcast. Where can people find you, Andrew? People can find me on Instagram, sometimes Twitter uh, at a Rothschild PT. All right. So if you like this story, please comment, share with your friends, give us a five-star rating, subscribe to Untold Physio Stories, wherever you listen to podcasts on Google, Apple, or Spotify. Uh, and make sure you reach out to us on social media or comments directly on the podcast on Spotify. If you want to get on the podcast with an interesting story, a big physio failure, reach out to Andrew or myself. And as always, you guys have a great day.